If you have a Bible this morning, I invite you to open it to Mark chapter number two. Mark chapter number two. We, uh, we've been in a series for the past several weeks now called Not the Same. And of course, the major thought behind the series is looking at encounters in the Gospels that Jesus had with people and how they left those encounters not the same. And so we're going to do that same thing this morning as we look at another encounter that Jesus had in Mark chapter number two. Now, as you're, uh, as you're finding that, I was, uh, as I was preparing to, to share this morning, I was reminded of an old story that is very familiar. In fact, many of you may have heard it before. There's a, there's a legend. I don't know if the story is true or not, but there's a legend or an old illustration that I think preachers have been saying and using for years. And the legend goes like this, once upon a time, that's how I'm not really sure if it was true or not, Uh, once upon a time, there was a writer who would go to the beach in order to do all of his writings. He was an older man, he wrote a lot of books, and this was just kind of the calm space that he would go to in order to get his writing accomplished for whatever book or next uh, phase he was in. And so the story goes, though, that before he would do his writing, every morning he would walk the, the shores of the beach. And one morning, a big storm had, had just come through, but that, that next morning, he's out there, and, and he's walking the beach, and he sees a boy in the distance. Now, what's interesting about the boy is as he's watching him, every now and then, the boy just stops. And he's a little far out, so he can't really tell what's happening, but as he gets closer, the old man gets closer and closer to the boy, he notices that the boy's not just stopping, he's reaching down ever so often, and he's grabbing something. And so he gets close enough to the boy to say, good morning, son. Uh, I'm just curious, what what are you doing? And the boy says, well, sir, the the storm has washed up a bunch of starfish onto the beach. And the sun's going to be coming up. The tide's going out. There's no way for the starfish to get back in the water. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get them all back in the ocean. And the old man kind of laughs a little bit because he looks as far as he can see one way down the beach, and then he looks as far as he can down the other way, and here's what he notices. There are tens of thousands of starfish. And so he looks at the little boy and he goes, well, son, you know, do, do what you want, but do you realize that there are tens of thousands of starfish on the beach? There's no way you can really make that much of a difference. And the little boy just bends back down, he grabs another starfish, and he throws it into the water, and he looks at the old man, and he goes, well, it made a difference for that one. And so it's a popular story. I've, I've heard it a lot myself, actually, but I, I was thinking about the story. It, it come to mind that I, as I was processing Mark chapter 2, but as I was thinking about the story, here's what I kept thinking about. Maybe the illustration is really not about a beach at all. As a matter of fact, maybe the beach is really just a representation of our neighborhoods, right? Like when I think about the beach, I think of a distant place, especially now that we live in North Mississippi rather than South Mississippi, I think of the beach as a long way away from here, all right? But maybe it's really not about a distant beach. Maybe the beach is just a representation of our communities. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, think about this. Maybe the starfish are really, really it's not about starfish at all. Maybe it's not a storm that's washed up starfish onto a beach that can't get back to the ocean on their own. Maybe the starfish is really just a picture of the people in our communities. You see, what I kept thinking about was, maybe that old illustration has nothing to do with the beach or storms or water or starfish. Maybe it has everything to do with the people in our backyards that can't get to Jesus unless somebody helps them. And I thought to myself, if that's really what it's about, how many people need Jesus and how much effect can I really cause and will I really make a difference? And then I read Mark chapter 2. Go with me. Let's look at verse number 1. It says, and when he returned to Capernaum, who do you think the he is? Jesus, of course. By the way, it's always a side note. If you're not sure what the answer is when someone asks you in church, just say Jesus, right? You're pretty much guaranteed to be right. And so when he returned, talking about Jesus to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he, talking about Jesus, was 
at home. Now I want to pause here for a moment because I think there's something interesting happening in Mark chapter 2 verse 1 that maybe we don't see by just reading this one verse. As a matter of fact, Jesus had been preaching in various places all throughout Galilee. If you were to jump back to Mark chapter 1 verse 39, here's what you would read. And he, talking about Jesus, went throughout all Galilee preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Now before this moment, Jesus has called his disciples. He's cast out, I don't know how many demons by this point in time. He's healed the sick. He's cleansed a leper. In other words, Jesus had been doing what was accustomed to him as his ministry here on earth. He had been changing people's lives throughout Galilee. However, now when we enter Mark chapter 2 verse 1, he has returned to Capernaum. Now, what I love about this moment is what Mark says at the end of this verse. Not just that he returned to Capernaum, but that it was reported that he was at home. Now, why would it be reported that Jesus was back in town? Well, let me just help you with this with just a little phrase. You ready? Because he's Jesus, right? So his ministry's been well heard of. His fame has spread throughout Galilee. Now you live in Capernaum. Maybe you can't get to where he was, but you're in Capernaum. You've heard about Jesus. You hear he's back. Obviously, you probably want to encounter Jesus. But I want you to notice something because this is so important. In order for anyone to know that Jesus was there, something had to happen first. This is what Mark's alluding to at the end of verse 1. It had to be reported that he was at home. Now church, listen to me, we're going somewhere with this. Someone had to spread the news that Jesus was there. Now I don't know if you know this, but this has to be one of the greatest objectives of all followers of Jesus. We know how awesome he is. Why would we not want to tell others where they can meet him too? This is not just common of Mark chapter 2 verse 1 that Jesus' fame has spread and people are talking about where he is next. When people encounter Jesus, they are changed in a way that they now report to other people, hey, I need you to come and check out something that happened to me. How many of us this week alone have reported that Jesus was here? When was the last time you invited someone to church so they could meet Jesus? Jesus is here. Don't you agree? Who did you tell where they could find him this week? They have been reporting Jesus is back home. Come and see Jesus. Now, I want to point out something else that's kind of interesting, and it's the idea of Jesus being at home. Now, what's interesting about this is that when we find him at home, it's in Capernaum. But Jesus' home was actually a place called Nazareth. So why would he now call Capernaum his home? Well, I want to point this out because I think this is significant for us to remember and understand. Just before this moment, we discover that Jesus was rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. If you want to read about that, you can find it in Luke chapter 4. Now, as it is with everyone who rejects Jesus, he will in fact make his home somewhere else. Oh, Nazareth didn't want me, so I'll just go back to heaven and ignore everybody else. No, no, no. Nazareth rejected him, so what did he do? He moved down to the next town, and guess what Capernaum did? They didn't reject him. They said, Jesus, welcome home. Friends, it is everybody's own personal decision that once you report about Jesus, you can't force them to follow him. You can't make them want something that you want. You've got to tell them where he is, let them see Jesus, and then they've got to decide whether or not they allow him to make a home in their their lives. I think it is fascinating that Jesus reports, or Mark specifically, that Jesus' home was now Capernaum because Nazareth had rejected him. Oh, I pray, I pray, I pray that we are not like Nazareth, rejecting Jesus. Look at verse 2, though. Jesus has been reported to be at home. So guess what happens? And many were gathered together. You say, Danny, how many? So that there was no more room, not even at the door. Now listen, I couldn't get past this phrase. 
and many were gathered together. And I thought to myself, I wonder if there are no longer gatherings to meet with Jesus that are, that are like this, not because Jesus isn't here, but because people are no longer reporting where to find him. You say, Danny, what do you mean? Well, this verse, in my opinion, sounds a lot like what church should be like today. In other words, so many people gathered to hear the word that we don't even have enough room for them. This is why Mark records, there was no room, not even at the door. You know what he's trying to tell us? Here's what he's saying. There used to be standing room only in the back. But now the house has gotten so full, there's not even standing room in the back anymore. People are out in the front yard. They can't even see him. All they can do is hear what he has to say. As a matter of fact, according to Luke's account, there were also in this crowd many Pharisees and teachers of the law. Here's what it says about them. From every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. Listen to me. I'm talking about every person from the oldest to the youngest, every class that you can think of, from the poorest to the most elite. Everybody wants to get to this house when it's reported that Jesus will be there. Why? Because he's Jesus. Hey, can I ask you a question, friends? Has Jesus stopped doing now what he was doing then? Is Jesus different today than he was when it was reported that he was at that house? Is it a different God that we serve and we worship? Can I tell you something? Let me answer it for you. It's absolutely not a different one. The question, in my opinion, is not whether or not people still want to meet this miracle-working, saved-by-grace kind of Jesus. That's not the question. The question is, how many people today are inviting people, reporting about Jesus, so that people can come and hear what Jesus has to say? And then the question becomes, what is Jesus doing? Well, this is why Mark says, and he was preaching the word to them. He was preaching the word to them. Friends, is this not still needed today? We need to show people what the word says. If we want to see lives transformed, we can't just leave them where they are. We have to get them to the word. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Listen, what Jesus was doing then is still what he wants his followers to do today. Preach the word. We have to take people from the world to the place where the word is being proclaimed. And it's the word of the Lord that changes people's hearts. And I got to thinking, I got to thinking about that boy that was willing to throw all those starfish back into the water. And I got to thinking about myself, am I willing to simply tell people where they can find Jesus? Can I ask you something, friends? What's more important, the starfish getting back into the ocean or a lost soul meeting Jesus? I don't think there's a question to which one is more important. The question is, are we doing it? Mark goes on, verse 3. He says, And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Now, who did they bring this man to? They brought this man to Jesus. Why? Because he's Jesus, right? Like, how much do I need to read over this phrase over and over and over again? As a matter of fact, I was telling my, my Sunday school teacher this morning, I was saying, listen, we, we pretty much preached the sermon for this morning in our Sunday school class. We looked at another group of people who had another friend who had a need, and guess what they did? They brought him to the only person who could fix it. Friends, how many people do we know that the answer to their life is Jesus? Jesus, we know where he is. We know how they can find him. The question is, are we willing to bring them to him? That's the question. I thought to myself, who am I bringing to Jesus? Who do I know that needs to be placed before Jesus so that he can change their lives forever? And listen, as I'm reading through the story, I, 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 we, we encounter three important groups that are mentioned in this verse. There are, first of all, the people who need to be carried. 
The man is described by nothing more than his situation. He is a paralytic. He's paralyzed. He can't get to Jesus on his own. He obviously needs help as described by the men who were carrying him. Now, can I tell you something? This is an overwhelming picture of people in the world. Now, they most likely aren't physically paralyzed, but they are spiritually All I could think about when I was reading about this was what Ron talked about last week when he's talking about the man in John 9 who was physically blind. I don't know if you remember this from the story, but it ends not about this man's physical blindness, but it ends as Jesus looks at some other people in the crowd and goes, hey, you may not be physically blind, but you know what all people are? They are spiritually blind, and more important than this guy being healed physically, this guy needed to be healed spiritually. And I thought to myself, All people are paralyzed by sin that keeps them from being able to get to God or be what God desires for them to be. Side note, many of the people at this time thought that his particular disease was a result of his own sin or his family's sin. They believed that God would issue this type of punishment to show how serious he takes his sin. That's why in John 9, when we were talking about the blind man, the disciples went to Jesus and said, Jesus, why is this guy blind? Is it his sin or his parents' sin? But Jesus says, it's not either of those, it's so that I can display my power. And I thought to myself, that is what I want for my paralyzed, sin-filled life. I want people to see that there is a change that has happened, not because of me, but because of Jesus. I want God's power to be seen in my life. Listen, there are people who need to be carried. Now, there's another group that's mentioned here. They're the people that do the carrying, right? Right? Like the only way this paralyzed guy could meet Jesus was if he had someone to get him there. He is literally physically paralyzed. He can't get anywhere without help. Now in this case, there are four men that carried him to Jesus. Now we don't know anything about the paralyzed man, probably because it could represent anybody, right? We also don't know anything about the four men that are carrying him. Why? Probably because it could represent anybody too. But it may be even more interesting what these guys are willing to do for their friend to meet Jesus. Look at verse 4. This is the part of the story that we all remember, right? Here's what happens. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now, this gives that old plea, lead your friends to Jesus, a whole new type of meaning, does it not? We've already read about how full the place was because everyone knew that Jesus was there. And if you can't get in there just by yourself, there's not even standing room only left, right? You got to be out in the front yard just to hear his voice. If you and I by ourselves can't get in that building, imagine how difficult it must be for four guys who are carrying another man on a mat. It's impossible, right? So what do they do? Well, picture this scene with me. Okay? Imagine it was happening right now. Now, we'd have to think about our roof a little bit differently, but you know what's interesting? We've got a large portion of our facility that has a roof kind of like the one in which Jesus is talking about here, right? Now, not in the sense that uh, we, we build our roofs the same as they did, but in the sense that it was flat. So imagine for a moment, picture this scene. I'm standing here, I'm, 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 I'm preaching, and the, and the house is packed. Now, here's what I will say. There's a little bit more than standing room only left in here, but it's a, it's a pretty full house, okay? Let's imagine for a second that I'm here and, and, and I'm teaching, and all of a sudden a hole is ripped out in the roof, and someone is lowered down on some kind of pulley system, and a mat drops down on the stage. The first thing I want to know is what's the security team doing in that moment, Right? Like, come on, you know we're all thinking it, right? Like, what they about to do? Matter of fact, I wish I could stage this just to see what would happen, right? The other thought is, what are all of you doing, right? Like, this is interesting. The other thought is, listen, I've had some major interruptions before, but I've never had dirt and grass and, 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 and glass and branches. I've never had all that stuff begin to fall around me as someone's lowered down from the ceiling. But that's exactly what's happening in this moment. Now, I read a little bit about the typical uh, Syrian roof at this day and time. Now, it's a little bit different than our construction, of course. It would have been a little bit easier to tear through. But I want you to know that it wasn't extreme 
extremely easy. It would have taken a moment for these guys to carry a guy up the back stairs, walk up on top of the roof, and then to begin to remove all the things that are there. Now, here's how they were constructed. They had timbers that laid parallel to each other, about two or three feet apart. Then crosswise over the timbers, there were sticks laid close to each other, thus forming the basic components of the roof. Then upon this laid reeds, branches of trees, thistles, and the whole thing was overlaid with about a foot of earth, which was then packed down to resist water. All told, the roof was about two feet thick, and during the spring, it was such good soil, good earth, that grass flourished on these primitive roofs. Now, here's what I want you to see. These roofs are so well constructed that it's pretty much like a piece of land is now produced on the top of this house. So I want you to understand it's a little different. It wouldn't maybe not be quite as messy, a little bit easier to fix the next day than maybe our roof would be. But I want you to know this too. This is not normal. You may be thinking, yeah, Danny, but when Jesus was somewhere, people were tearing through roofs all the time. No, no, no. This is not a normal day. (laughs) Also, I just, I had this thought in the back of my mind. I don't know who owns this place, the house that Jesus is in. Most likely, by the way, it's a house, just a personal residence. Some people think that it's Peter's house because of Mark chapter 1 and some things that are said there. But listen, we really don't know. But regardless of whose house it is, can you imagine how angry they might be just with the number of people who are crowding into their house? Now, some of you have spouses out there who their house is like immaculate, right? Like a crumb hits the floor and they got a broom or a swiffer or a, 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 um, the little thing that you hold in your hand and you, uh, uh, yeah, whatever that, dust buster, right? They're right there on it, you know? Some of you, some of you are like that. You can't fathom the amount of people who are crowding, who are breaking your furniture, who are knocking over lamps, who are bringing all kinds of dirt and trash, and who knows what, by the way, into your house. So all I can think about is, man, how angry must this family be with the mess that they're making? Now, not that that's not bad enough. Now you see these random guys who are on your roof who have busted the entire thing up. Listen, it wasn't that bright in there, and then all of a sudden, sunlight came out of nowhere. And you're thinking, wow, how am I going to explain to my wife when she gets home what has happened in our home today? But really, here's the thing that we need to process the most. The difficulty of bringing this friend to Jesus doesn't stop them. Now, just go with me for a moment. When I think about myself, I, I talk myself out of, a, out of simple opportunities just to connect with my neighbors when I see them outside to have a conversation with them, right? Like, I'm not even willing to walk across the street. I certainly wouldn't be willing to drop down through a roof. However, the goal was still the goal, no matter the challenge. They knew their friend needed Jesus. They would and did Whatever it took to get him to Jesus, is this how we bring our friends to Jesus? You know what I got to thinking about? I don't think Jesus wants you to carry those who are light or who are easy. I don't think that's the requirement. He wants us to carry all our friends to Jesus regardless of the difficulty. And I got to thinking once again about that old star thrower boy uh, that we talked about. Am I willing to bring people to the one who can really make a difference in their lives no matter what? Then listen, there's another person in the group. There's the person that they carried him to. Look at verse five. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. Now I think about what I would have been processing in this moment. I would have been like everyone else in the crowd that day. I would see a paralyzed man in need of healing. However, Jesus sees way beyond just our mortal bodies. Now, I'm certainly not trying to be insensitive to anyone with physical disabilities, but Jesus looks past a temporary mortal body and sees a soul that will last beyond eternity. Now, think about this. We're all noticing a man who needs physical healing, which 
by the way, will only end up dead physically like the rest of us somewhere down the line anyway. It's just temporary. However, Jesus sees all of eternity and the real issue that needs to be addressed. Process this from Jesus' lens. In light of eternity, the physical healing of a present mortal body pales in comparison to the spiritual healing of a sin-sick soul. And I thought this, listen, here's what's processing through my mind. Why is it that we stand in awe of physical healing, but look past the miracle of a soul saved by the mercy and grace of Jesus? Think about it. What is the more impactful moment? Someone being healed physically or someone being saved from eternal separation from God. Yet in our minds, we always want to see a miracle, right? In our minds, we always want to see the display. In our minds, we've gotten so accustomed to people walking down an aisle that we have forgotten what is actually happening, the miracle of someone who is dead in their sins being brought to life in Jesus. Which one is more impactful? Jesus has the power to forgive sin. Not all of us are physically broken, but we are all spiritually broken. All of us will die physically, but because of Jesus, none of us ever have to truly die because we can live with him for all eternity. Now, I want to show you something that I think is a little interesting. Mark points out that Jesus healed this man when he saw their faith. Now, I had this crazy moment of thinking, this is just Danny theology, by the way, so just take this for what it's worth. Certainly, Jesus was known at this time for healing. I'm not not doubting that these guys knew Jesus could make their friend walk again. However, that may not be what Mark was pointing out when he talked about seeing their faith. You see, before this moment, Mark recorded Jesus teaching another time. This is in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. Listen to this. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, so here he is, he's preaching, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now don't miss this. Here's his phrase. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now I want you to notice something. The word Jesus used for believe in Mark 1.15 and the word Mark used for Jesus seeing their faith in Mark chapter 2 verse 5 are from the same exact word. Now, Say, Danny, what do you mean? Well, you might be in the building this morning because you know where to find Jesus. You might have even been carried here, or better yet, drugged here by someone who wanted you to be here. However, being in this church doesn't make you any more a Christian than standing in a garage makes you a car. You have to, like Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel. Now, Danny, where are you going? Listen to me. Could it be that Jesus, seeing their faith was really about him noticing their trust in him as savior and less about them wanting their friend to be able to walk. Now I know what you're thinking, Danny, there's no way. He's a crippled man. They've heard what Jesus could do. They want him to be able to walk again. Well, listen, I'm with you, but go with me. Could it be that Jesus recognized their desire for their friend to be saved more than their desire for their friend to be able to walk? Now, why would I think this? Well, here's why. Jesus doesn't tell the man to get up and walk because his body is physically healed. Now he's going to, but he doesn't yet. What's his first phrase to this man? Here's what he tells him. Son, not get up and walk, but son, your sins are forgiven. Now listen to me. Maybe the, maybe the friends just wanted this guy to trust in Jesus as Savior, and the physical healing was just a byproduct of him being there with Jesus. Say, Danny, why do you think this? Here's why. The paralysis that our world is facing isn't about physical healing. Jesus has the power to forgive sins. 
As a matter of fact, Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. David put it like this in Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Micah put it like this in Micah 7, 19. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Paul talks about forgiveness like this in 1 Timothy 1, 13. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy. He goes on in verse 15 to say, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And I thought to myself, oh, how I wonder who is here today that needs to hear this same thing from Jesus. Listen, you didn't have to be dropped through a roof this morning. You were able to simply walk through the front door and find plenty of space to hear from Jesus this morning, but could it be that he wants you right now, friends, to repent and believe just as he desired from this man who was dropped through the roof? Could it be that he wants to forgive you today so that you can begin to walk, by the way, listen, don't miss this, so that you can begin to walk for the very first time, not physically, but walk spiritually with Jesus because you've never been able to walk with him before. Maybe you could physically walk when you came in, but were you able to walk with Jesus? Let me tell you something, friends. He can make you walk with him today. How many are here who need to repent and believe, who are also paralyzed and stuck in their sin without hope, but Jesus can in fact make you walk with him? Now let me keep going. Verse six, look at this. It it goes on. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now listen, this is an interesting moment. Don't be so down on the scribes and the Pharisees. This is in fact very unique. Who is this Jesus that can make statements like this? Only God can forgive sins. As a matter of fact, C.S. Lewis puts this in perspective in his book, Mere Christianity. Here's what he writes. Listen to this. Now, unless the speaker is God, forgiving sins is really so preposterous as to be comic. We should laugh. We can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself. You tread on my toes and I forgive you. You steal my money and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man himself unrobbed and untrodden on who announced that he forgave you for treading on other men's toes and stealing other men's money? Like, I don't have the right to forgive you for what you did for someone else. I can only forgive you for what you've done to me. But listen, this is what Jesus did. He told people that their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult all the other people who their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitatingly behaved as if he was the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. This makes sense only if he really was the God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the mouth of any speaker who is not God, these words would imply what can only regard as a silliness and conceit unrivaled by any other character in history. But wait a second, friends. This is God. He can forgive offenses. He can forgive what you've done to even someone else. Now, this moment is typical of the religious leaders. In fact, There will always be people who don't believe in Jesus who will try to keep others from believing in him too. Listen, I'm reminded of this old story. Kayla and I had a privilege uh, uh, several years back. We went with a a church trip that did a mission trip to, to Sturgis, South Dakota. Now that name may sound familiar to you because that's where the Sturgis bike rally is held every single year. They estimate that over a million people go through this town that is smaller than Saltillo for that particular week of the event. It is absolutely insane. I can testify to this. Now, we saw all kinds of things that were crazy, all right? Imagine the darkest uh, 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 biker gangs that you can think of now multiplying by all those people. And yes, not only at night, but during the day, there are some wild things to be seen. Now, we went there, we worked with an Indian reservation, but we also worked among the bikers. We went with an organization called the Hellfighters, friends of ours who had a motorcycle ministry who were ministering to people who came there. Now, what was interesting was one day, we got to do this thing called the crosswalk. Now, here's what we did. We had a guy that was there with us. He had this huge cross. He walks all across America, by the way, with the crosswalk, but he's there for the Sturgis bike rally pretty much every year, and here's what we do. 
We take turns carrying the cross as we walk down the streets of Sturgis with bike rally stuff going everywhere, bars all over the place, people partying left and right, all kinds of obscenities that you can imagine. All that's happening, and here's what we're doing. We're walking in the midst of that with a, with a cross down these streets. We're talking about Jesus. We're passing out tracts. We're telling people how their lives could be changed forever. Now, one of the most interesting things that happened during this time was when we would get close to bikers, do you know what they would do? They would start revving up their bikes as loud as they could. Why? They didn't want anybody to hear the message of Jesus, lest their lives be impacted by it too. You say, Danny, why do you tell us that story? Because this oftentimes happens when people want to hear Jesus. There's a lot of other noises that try to crowd it out. But also, I couldn't get away from this phrase that Mark uses, questioning in their hearts. And I thought to myself, how often do I too question in my heart whether or not Jesus can actually make a difference in someone else's life? You may be thinking, he's Jesus, Danny. Of course he can make a difference. Well, let me, let me ask you a question, friends. If we believed that, then why don't we carry more people to him? Can I expect my friends, my family, my neighbors to trust in Jesus when I don't? I got to thinking about those starfish again and the laughter of the old man who thought it was a waste of time. And I thought to myself, am I like the old man that thinks Jesus would be wasting his time on certain people? Am I the one who slows down the progress that God wants to make? And then watch this. Here's what happens. Verse 8, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Now, what a wild moment in Scripture. It's no surprise that Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking. We know from other texts in the Gospels that Jesus knew what was in man. So he presents them with an interesting question. Was it harder to believe he could forgive sins or that he could heal a paralyzed man? Now, as I was reading this text, I came across an interesting way of illustrating what Jesus was doing. This is how it was put. Imagine that I came to you and I said, hey, you've got two choices. I can write you a check right now for a hundred million dollars because I have that in the bank. And this is a little different because you know me and I don't have that in the bank, okay? But imagine you don't, all right? Imagine you don't know me. I, I can write you a check, hundred million dollars. Right now I can put it in your hands. Or I can take the hundred thousand dollars that I have in my pocket and I can give it to you right now. Now imagine this for a moment, which would be easier would it be easier for me to write the check for $100 million? Well, if I have it, then no, that wouldn't be easier. That would hurt me a lot because it's $100 million. But if I don't have it, then it's easier for me to write a faulty check and leave the room, right? Now, which one's harder? Is it harder for me to give you the 100000 that's in my pocket? Well, no, it won't cost me as much as the $100 million, so that would be easier for me if I have that money. But if I don't have that money and you know I don't, then guess what you want? You want me to prove it on the spot that I've got it in my pocket, right? So here's Jesus' bargaining chip with them. He goes, look, I know that you don't think I can forgive sins. That's way harder than maybe healing this man, which, by the way, both of them are extremely hard, Right? No one is doing either one of these things. But if I just walked up and told you that your sins are forgiven, you can't know if that's real or not. I can make that statement to any of you, and I can leave the room. And guess what? You don't know if I did it or not. You won't know till later. But for a man to be crippled and me to tell you that I can heal him, but I don't do it on the spot, you know. That guy's a phony, right? Right? So here's what Jesus does. He goes to show you that I can not only forgive sins, I can also heal this man. He shows them the $100,000 in his pocket, and he tells the man to give up. Get up. Now you say, Danny, why is that important? Because listen, if I'm walking around with $100,000 in my pocket, then I bet you will believe that I got $100 million in the bank. Can I tell you something? Jesus is the guy who could walk around with $100,000 in his pocket. You want to know why? Because that was nothing 
compared to the hundred million that he's got in the bank. I love that Jesus throws them completely for a loop by going, listen, I can do them both and it's incredible. And so this is it, look at verse 12. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. Now I love the word, the, 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 the verb he rose, it's in the passive tense really in the Greek. It should really read this way, and he was raised. Listen, he didn't get up on his own power. Imagine Jesus telling him to get up and walk and maybe he can't. So here's what Jesus does. He reaches down and he grabs his hand and he lifts the man up and the man gathers his mat, and he walks out the door like everybody else who walked in the door. He came in not being able to walk. He leaves that day on his own two feet, and guess what? They're all amazed and glorified God. Even these religious leaders that were so skeptical undoubtedly left there not the same. And I wondered to myself, who has seen this type of change that Jesus has done in my life and left not the same. That's the type of impact on Jesus. So you're like, Danny, that's a, that's a huge story. That's a lot going on. What are you trying to tell us? Well, listen to me. I was challenged in several ways by reading this encounter. The first one was this. When was the last time I invited someone to church so that they could hear about Jesus? It's pretty simple and basic, right? When was the last time? You know what, friends? Listen, I'm looking at you. Honestly, look at me. I don't remember the last time I personally looked somebody in the eyes and said, hey, why don't you come to First Baptist Saltillo? I, I, I'd, I'd love for you to hear about Jesus today. It's been a while. Second thing was this. Who do I know that needs Jesus, and am I willing to do whatever it takes to get them to him? Well, you say, well, Danny, you just told us you didn't even invite him to church. If you are not even willing to say something, how much more are you willing to do something for them? I say, I agree. It hurts a little bit, right? The word stings a little bit. Here was the third one. I thought this. Does my life bring praise to God like this guy's life did? Listen, maybe you're here this morning. You realize that you need Jesus just like this paralyzed man in the story. You might have plenty of physical needs that are important, but you realize right now that none of those come close to the need you have for Jesus. Can I tell you something, friends? You can come in here spiritually not able to walk, and you can leave here today walking with Jesus. Listen, maybe you're here this morning, you realize that you need to do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. Well, let me just, you, you, you've seen this this morning, and you've thought, what in the world is Corey doing? Why is he walking on this stage? As a matter of fact, some of you are brilliant at problem solving, and you've already done the math, and you've been working some things out in your mind. Let me, let me show you this board for a moment, okay? We're up to 6,440. You say, what, Danny? Well, I read a statistic, statistically speaking, that about 1,000 people die every 10 minutes in our world. 1,000 people. It's actually like 1,008, I think, but 1,000 was a little bit easier number, so I scaled a little bit, all right? 1,000 people every 10 minutes die. Now, I looked up several other statistics, and here's what I found. According to research, about 31% of our population in the world claims to be a Christian, all right? Now, that's any type of Christian. So I scaled that back, and I looked up evangelical Christianity, people who believe they're born again, surrender their life to Jesus, and here's what I discovered. Out of the 31%, 26% identify that way. So you say, Danny, what does that look like? Well, I'm going to be honest. I can't do that math, so I asked other people to do that math, and here's what we discovered. About 8% of the people who die every 10 minutes, those 1,000 people are actually, and this is probably a high number, are actually people who died following Jesus. In other words, on this side of eternity, they knew Jesus before they died, and now they are in eternity with God. Hallelujah. About 8%. So out of every 1,000 that dies every 10 minutes, about 920 of those people die and spend eternity in hell separated from God forever. Since we left Sunday school at 10 o'clock till right now, 6,440 people, roughly speaking, have went on to eternity without Jesus. You know what that means? I'll be honest, I don't know what that means. But I can tell you this, 
it is far worse than anything that we could possibly ever imagine. And here's what I discovered. There were four guys in Mark chapter 2 who said, you know what, I know one guy that I don't want to be a part of that 6,440 people, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to grab him up, and I'm going to get him on this mat, and we're going to carry him to this house, and we're going to do whatever it takes to introduce this guy, to put him before the feet of Jesus. You know what I thought about? I thought about that star-throwing kid who says, you know what, I may not be able to throw all of them back, but for this one that I threw back, it made a difference. And you know what I thought about? We might not be able to get all 6,440, but what if we committed today that we we're going to shrink that number because here's what we know. We want that to happen for all of them, but though we can't do it for all of them, we can do it for one of them. And so here's what we're deciding. We're deciding that we're going to do for one what we wished we could do for everyone, and we're going to put them on a mat, and we're going to bring them to Jesus, and we're going to lay them at his feet. And we're going to say, here he is. This is the guy who can change everything. So listen, I don't know where you're at in the room this morning. I know I've talked for a long time, and I'm stopping, I promise. But here's what I do know. You either know him or you don't. You're either in here and you're not walking with him, or you're in here and you are. And so there are two things that can happen this morning for whoever those people are in this room. Either one, you need to be healed so that you can walk out of here walking with Jesus. And if that's you, friend, listen to me. You are here. You've been presented before him. Will you choose to follow Jesus? Will you give your life to him? You can do it. I'll be standing in that lobby in just a few moments. You come find me. Say, Danny, I don't know what kind of paralytic, I don't know what those words were. I don't know what you're talking about, but here's what I know. I'm not walking with Jesus and I need him. Listen, you come find me. I'll open my Bible and I'll tell you how you can start walking with Jesus. But you know what? I bet there's a much larger number in this room that's already walking with him. But I wonder how much we're willing to walk across the street as we're walking with Jesus to bring our neighbor and put him before his feet. I would dare say there's a lot of us in this room that aren't doing that. I don't know if that number is impactful enough for you. But even at a high estimate, that's a lot of folks that are stepping off into eternity without Jesus. Now you say, Danny, it's their decision to follow Christ. We can't make that zero. I agree. Not all the starfish can get back in the ocean. I agree. But what about the one? What about the one that you can carry to Jesus and make a difference? Are you willing? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to report about Christ? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to carry people to Jesus? Are you willing for your life to bring enough praise that people leave glorifying God? Are you willing to be like these guys we encounter in Mark 2? Are you willing to lead your neighbors to Jesus? Listen, I don't know where you are, but here's what I know. When God's word is preached, it demands a response from us. So listen, you respond to Jesus however you need to this morning. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you and thank you. We praise you, Jesus. You are awesome.